faculty, guests, graduate students, all students that are present and may come later. Thank you all for coming. Um, first thing I have to, there's some breaking news. As uh, the famous spoof by Chevy Chase on Saturday Night Live, President Sanchez has been continuously in touch with me as I was organizing this symposium to make sure that the entombment of General Franco did not disrupt these academic sessions. And therefore we decided that it would be done at 4 a.m. this morning, this coming morning. So we're all in deep sleep. And uh, when you wake up, as Jerry Chase used to say, Charlie and I live, we will find out that General Isimo Franco is still dead. <laughs> we hope. So now let's get to the serious business in which we have gathered this morning. And in fact, it's an old business, as we could say, because I can't believe that actually 30 years ago, right around this time, in the month of October, we first gathered at this university to commemorate the anniversary of the coming of the exiles, the Spanish Republican exiles, to the Americans. And at that time, we were gifted to have among us the most notable of them all, they were still alive and kicking, and they had left an indelible trace at our institutions and universities. Names like Eugenio Granel, Manuel Duran, Roberto Ruiz, Gonzalo Sobejano, and Graciela Palaunemes, who participated in that symposium, among others, and our own Victor Fuentes, still present here. And as you know, we are dedicating in memoriam this symposium to Graciela and to Gonzalo Sobejano, who was a visiting professor at the University of Maryland in the fall of 1976, when I was starting as a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania and miss him very dearly that semester. Thank God for my training, we managed to bring him back to Pennsylvania. And then I ended up by the chance of life at this institution, which is now, as you can see, significantly involved in the commemoration of exile studies from the vantage of the Spanish Republic. 1989, 1999, 2019, and there's a crop of magnificent doctors that are now teaching at other campuses in the U.S. that would prove to the sort, the tradition that our own Nobel uh, laureate Juan Ramón Jiménez started in 1943, 1944. Exile is a global, uh, plural, diverse, and protean phenomenon that has touched every people and nation at one particular juncture of their history. Associated with diasporas, it identifies with humanity since our known, no, since our known ancestors moved across Africa some five million years ago, exilio to jump outside. El Gosul, the carta should have written. Contemporaneously, it is identified by political forms of exclusion that banish seemingly a large groups of opponents from the modern nation state created after the liberal bourgeois revolution. Exiles are politically motivated as well as humanly disastrous and keep touching millions of souls on every continent coined as refugees by international conventions since 1922. But many times, 
Exiles may be identified with cultural greatness and distinction. Because of the Spanish Civil War, Republican exile, Picasso's Guernica, or our former University of Maryland professor, Juan Ramón Jiménez. The Spanish Civil War was a cataclysm in which modern historiography has unveiled its local and international military, Italian fascist and Nazi German plotting routes along with fascist troops from Spain, as well as a dismal non-intervention society of nation policies and U.S. arms embargo. Let's not forget that. In fact, the end of the conflict that initially banished about half a million Spaniards anticipated the disaster already seen in Manchuria and Abyssinia to the battlefields worldwide through 1945, with more than 45 million refugees that eventually started being settled at the end of the 1970s, when it marked the symbolic return to transitional democratic Spain of just a few of those last Republican exiles, who unfortunately were not heard in that process. Contrary to the exemplary Mexico policies, the United States administration was particularly restricted in the influx of Spanish exiles. In fact, their numbers were marginal, mostly representing a minority of academics, thinkers, artists, and professionals, backed by personal and institutional affidavits of support that could circumvent the 1920s 259 immigration yearly Spanish quota to the USA. This did not prevent many to be actively spied by the FBI, sometimes even through their own, as in the case of the Basque government representative, Juris José de Galíndez, later kidnapped and assassinated by Dominican dictator Rafael Trujillo. By the way, he will become tomorrow's neighbor of Franco's tomb in the Pardo uh, Cemetery beyond life. Other reasons justify such restrictions. The follow-up to the chaos between left-leaning liberals and communists in favor of the Spanish loyalists versus Catholic co-defenders of the Francoist usurpers in the USA. The Roosevelt administration arms embargo, which the president qualified later as a great mistake when facing the Republic's defeat, implied its World War II continuation. The rhetorical repatriation to the USA of the ad hoc aid to Spain through the surviving volunteers of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, or the North American Committee to aid Spanish democracy offspring, the American Medical Bureau, as well as the numerous NGOs which eventually managed to film the exiles in their natural habitat. And today, at 7, we will be moving to the cultural um, uh, <coughs> office of the Spanish Embassy to witness what these NGOs were doing to bring support to the uh, Spanish refugees through the film Refuge. It will be uh, given a new soundtrack by NAA and so forth. One of its heirs, the Joint Anti Fascist Refugee Committee, eventually fell prey to prison sentences thanks to the Committee of Un American Activities and the Red Scare in the 1940s. Concurrently, two noted women from progressive Spain who had come to the forefront of public affairs in the wake of the 1933 universal voting rights, journalists Constancia de la Mora and Isabel Rollazaba, were examples of the exile's attempts to sway US public opinion, to support the removal of the dictatorship, particularly with the defeat of the Axis and the creation of the United Nations. And all of that will appear about tomorrow, uh, about the U.S. policies involvement with Spain. But the U.N. swayed by Britain and the USA failed to impose an intervention from outside and placed the burden of change on accords from within, consequently weakening the Republican possibilities to force a real debunking of the dictatorship. The leader of the free world systematically resisted intervening in what he considered a domestic matter that could not risk any Soviet influence, while eventually accepting to facilitate financial aid to the Franco regime, the lifting of the 1946 UN resolution 
the reinstatement of an ambassador to Spain in 1950, and the signing of the Madrid Accords on September 22, 1953, for the establishment of four U.S. military bases, one of them still open at Rota, Paris. Despite their successive setbacks, culminated by the admittance of Franco Spain to the UNESCO in 1953 and the UN in 1955, or the visit of President Eisenhower to Madrid in 1959, who I already witnessed, the Spanish exile representatives kept trying but faced unsurmountable stumbling blocks in order to sway the different U.S. administrations back to the logic of their democratic aspirations. Despite these obstacles, U.S. institutions of higher learning were able to attract a select group of exiles that upheld and upgraded within U.S. Pan-Americanism the prestige of the Spanish language, literature, and culture, particularly around the Golden Age which paradoxically contributed to a sort of stagnation and menaces with peninsular Islamism. Along this incomplete, apoetic, but extraordinary list, we may point to poet and critic Pedro Salinas, who will be remembered, who substituted John Dos Passos translator Jose Robles at Johns Hopkins University, who had been assassinated in Republican Spain. Luis Almuda at Montreal. Roberto Ruiz at Wheaton College, Jorge Yen at Wesley College, at Wellesley College, or a few of these impressive literary examples. We'll hear about all of these through our papers and music. Because tomorrow, in the Mexican Cultural Institute, we will have a musical concert in homage to these Republican exiles. Some of the exiles in the U.S. had also re-immigrated from Latin America, particularly from traditional, the traditional intellectual hub at the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. Juan Ramón Jiménez, among them, went the other way from Maryland to Puerto Rico, where he would be awarded a New York Times. Plenty of Spanish Republican women also kept alive in exile the liberation claims they had harbored during the progressive Republican Spanish years. 1931-1939. Among them, former Republican Deputy and Prison Journal Director Victoria Kent. She edited for two decades in New York City the journal Iberica and also launched a relief organization, Spanish Refugee Aid, which was alive until the, 19, the late 1980s. Another noted publication for the second Republican Exile Resistance, and we'll hear about it today, uh, today and tomorrow was España Libre, of the Sociedades Españolas Confederadas, an offspring of the New York City Civil War Comité Antifascista Español. That gathered anarchist and socialist trade union tendencies. The Sociedades gathered 60,000 members in the 1940s and 50s, and were all going to collect more than 2 million for the support of Republican refugees, political prisoners, and clandestine resistance in Spain. This is how big the memory of the Spanish Civil War and the presence of the exiles were in the US. The prestige of this unique but, uh, of this unique but non exhaustive crop of Silver Age Spanish culture and exile thrived on campuses as well as film and scientific or artistic institutions. Luis Mulier, to whom Victor Fuentes dedicated a great span of his life. Um, Jose, uh, Jose Fernandez Mora, the Petro, Petro Russell successor at Greenbaum, and today we will hear from one of his successors, Professor Mark Johnson. Jose Luis said, as the Dean of the Architecture School at Harvard University, and so many more. As a vivid example of this Republican saga, Juan Negrín's, the president, the last president of the cabinet of the Spanish Republic, so, became a noted neurologist, and his son, disciple, Severo Ochoa, was a 1959 Nobel Prize in physiology. Meanwhile, and where you hire historian Nicolás Sánchez Albornoz, the son of one of Miguel's successors at the Republican head, Claudio Sánchez Albornoz. Ironically, Nicolás had fled to freedom with Manuel Laman in 1948 from that ominous valley of the falling, what I call the civil mountain, who will finally lose his inventor. An endless flame that the undersigned and his students 
has tried to keep throughout the last three decades here in the US and particularly at the University of Maryland. A symbol for the most prestigious 1939 Spanish exile predecessors, researchers, and studies. Our own Juan Ramon Jimenez, Jose Ramon Marra Lopez, who preceded me <coughs> in this position at Maryland. Or Américo Castro, disciple, and also my former teacher, Russell P. Siebel, who was chair of the Spanish department in the 1960s. And again, Gonzalo Solejano and Graciela Palau de Neves, who we are behind. Socialist jurist, Luis Jimenez de Azúa, president of the Second Republic in exile, and co-writer of its 1931 exemplary constitution, who called for workers of all kinds, evoked by my own father here in 1989, a personal friend of my grandfather at the Escuela Matense de Estudios Superiores, where he formed many of the intellectuals of the Second Republic, reminded us, in view of the recent harsh penalties against separatist leaders in Catalonia, of the necessity of considering them, maybe, as altruistic scapegoats, in order to overturn exaggerated present historical references to fascism and exile, which led to unnecessary violence. Nevertheless, Jimena de Asua also contended that overextended national differences have also been extremely damaging for the sake of the Spanish Republic. And Josep Ferrater Mora also reminded us that we cannot attempt to move toward history in order to rewrite our present, but come from it attempting to avoid its mistakes. And particularly, he evoked the privileged vantage of exile which allows to recognize plural Spains, what I call Las Españas, efforts, differences, and mistakes. What Jaume Vicente Vives coined for Catalonia, saying, good sense, and Rauscha, passion. May we learn during this hearty symposium all of our UMD passionate good sense and tradition around the Spanish Republican exiles of 1939. Delenda non sunt studia exili Hispaniae, Republicae y Mariata. Thank you. Bye. And I want to thank all of you for attending and all of those of you who will be participating in this conference. I also want to extend a special commendation to Professor Jose Maria Navarro Calderon, trying to get through my Spanish, please bear with me, uh, and colleagues for planning and organizing this conference. Um, the college is pleased to be one of the supporters. Issues of migration and the lives and experiences of people who are labeled exiles and refugees are at the center of much of the public discourse throughout the world today. I don't really need to tell you that. You know it very well. We witness people fleeing poverty, destruction, and violence, or we learn of those who are migrating in search of a better life. While contemporary news reports provide pictures and accounts of these excursions, the meanings for the people themselves, for those whom they leave behind, for the children and future generations, and the impact on the communities left behind and the places of settlement is the story that we learn and keep on learning only after years have passed. So I think it's particularly significant that my colleagues here at Maryland have chosen an 80-year span in which to examine and honor the story of refugees, 
who migrated to the Americas, and particularly to the U.S., and particularly to Maryland uh, after the Spanish Civil War. As others will tell you throughout the day, this story is a part of the story of the University of Maryland, and particularly the College of Arts and Humanities. The School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures is housed in Juan Ramon Jimenez Hall, and this conference is being held within weeks of the passing of Professor Emerita Graciela Nemes, one of the most prominent critics of the, noble, of the works of the Nobel Laureate of the Nobel Laureate and Spanish poet Jimenez. This is a fitting occasion in which to honor and remember them both and many others whom Professor um, Calderon has just mentioned. I often say that many aspects of the College of Arts and Humanities can be described with three C's, creativity, culture, and collaboration. Language, culture, history, literature, and the synergies that emerge through the research and scholarly collaborations that abound in the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures, in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, and throughout the college, produce gatherings like this one and help us develop a deeper understanding of the roots and influences of all the forces, of all of these forces, on contemporary political and social life. I commend you on this conference, and I wish you a productive and stimulating day. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues, students, and distinguished guests. So on your program, uh, the next speaker was to be Dr. Keshavars. I am not Dr. Keshavars. I am Dr. Al Penrose. I'm Associate Professor of Spanish and Associate Director for Academic Affairs for the school. Um, I received a call from Fatima last night. She has suffered a slight setback in her recovery from a fall that she took about two weeks ago. She'll be fine, but she just needs to have a day of rest and probably see a doctor today. Um, so I bring you greetings from her and uh, a few comments, and I will keep them brief because I know that we are limited by time. Um, first of all, she wanted to thank Professor Nardo Calderon, um, and all the other people involved in putting together this symposium. As you all know, this is a major event. We have staff, graduate students, and uh, faculty who have helped put this together. But the main uh, agent, of course, and organizer has been Professor Nardo. Uh, she thanks them for organizing a timely, an important event, uh, an event that brings together, as you know, or can imagine, scholars from the U.S. and beyond, former students of the Department of Spanish and Portuguese graduate students, uh, and uh, community members. in an act that foments academic community building. And I think this is a very important, this is Mel speaking, this is a very vital part of what we do in the School of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. And I think it's also important for a scholarship within UMD and without across the nation and across the world. This type of academic community building, bringing together scholars and students and others interested in this topic. Um, Dr. Keshavar notes that this, is a, this contemporary topic affects many uh, programs across the school. People, other people, other scholars, and students who are researching and teaching um, issues 
in exile studies and international migration. As we all know, international <coughs> migration, as I speak, is one of the world's central concerns. The crisis of international migration. Uh, we can talk about exile and other forms of migration. And for me, as an 18th and 19th century scholar of Spain, I see that this, we're building on uh, what was happening uh, at that time, especially in the 19th century. And we can think of uh, a major writer, uh, Jose Maria Blanco White, who had to escape Spain when Fernando VII uh, began to rule with an iron fist and tolerated absolutely nothing that would go against his regime. Uh, and began writing from London with uh, an international perspective, an exterior perspective, but also from uh, and somehow still within uh, Span Spain and Spanish culture. Um, personally, I'm delighted to see uh, many of my former students here uh, who will be speaking, giving papers, and also moderating panels. It's a joy to see all of you, and I hope to spend a little bit of time one on one. And it's also a delight to see so many of our current graduate students here. That support um, on their part is also vital for keeping events like this and the department as a whole um, building programs for the future. Both Professor Keshavaros and I wish you a productive and enjoyable Symposium. Thank you. Good morning. It is a pleasure to see you here this morning, and especially our current students and alumni. And it is an honor and a privilege to welcome all of you on behalf of the Graduate School to this remarkable two-day series of presentations and conversations keeping Spain's exiles in the Americas and Maryland alive in our hearts. The Department of Spanish and Portuguese, the University of Maryland, and the broader community are very fortunate to be able to count among this event's participants many who have traveled far to be here, for example, from Mexico City to Paris, and via video, the pioneering linguist and social and political critic, Noam Chomsky. Especially gratifying and important is the participation of current graduate students and alumni from the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. For you, to participate in this event is a wonderful opportunity to contribute to and learn about the scholarly understanding of one of the most significant facets of the human experience in the past and the present. Exile, displacement, and their social, political, and cultural legacies. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, my colleague, Professor Naro Calderon, for all of your hard work in making this event possible. Hello, oh, people. <laughs> I'm, I'm the last but not the least, because as you can see, our logo in the Department of Spanish Portuguese is the first one to appear in, uh, in these things, and that means that we are sponsoring this. We are like the main force behind it, and Professor Nairo Calderon, uh, we're very fortunate to have him organizing this, um, in this occasion, but also dedicating his life work to uh, work on this topic of the Spanish exiles, not only in the Americas, but all over the world. And uh, today is basically commemorating this, uh, this wonderful, um, event that happened in 1989 in our department. And um, I'd like to, before uh, saying anything else, I'd like to, uh, as you can see, uh, the College of Arts and Humanities and Grad School and the School of Languages are partners uh, with us in this event. And also, uh, Acción Española and the uh, Spanish Embassy and the Mexican uh, Cultural Institute, did I forget anyone? And the Miller Center for the History Department and the French and Italian uh, department within the School of Languages and Religious and Cultures. Did I forget anyone? Thank you, all of you. Thank you so much. 
and to our distinguished guests who are visiting us, for the, many of you for the first time, and some of you are repeating offenders, like Marisa, or uh, uh, Professor uh, Victor Fuentes. Right? Um, welcome, bienvenidos. Our department, I like to see it as a place of refuge. And I think that started very early on with Juan Ramón Jiménez undoubtedly, but also it continues throughout our history. In the 60s, the Cuban exiles came, and in the 70s, you know, the, the, the Argentinians, the Chileans, the Uruguayans were here. Um, our department has always been this place where, you know, people from uh, running away from the dictatorships uh, can come to find some kind of intellectual help. And uh, we are, um, I think, continuing on that tradition and not only all the exiles from Spain come, but also the ones from Latin America. And uh, I'd like to thank Prof Prof Professor Graciela Palau Nemes, who indeed passed away about three weeks ago, and who was a wonderful uh, force behind uh, you know, the, uh, the studies of Juan Ramón Jiménez, the, but also the developer of the curriculum on Latin American studies, you know, Latin American literature. And she was a wonderful bridge between uh, Spain and Latin America, and we have tried to continue uh, on that tra tradition, uh, welcoming you know this uh, both sides of the Atlantic into one. And uh, I'd like to basically uh, celebrate this occasion in which we uh, we once again talk about the Spanish exiles here in in the U.S. and in Maryland and in the Americas to say the Department of Spanish and Portuguese continues you know, in this tradition. And thank you, Professor Navarro Thank you, all of you, for your support. And we uh, will continue. Bienvenidos. Again, thank you for coming. Thank you for all the support we have gotten from all the different schools, the dean, uh, our colleagues, our graduate students. You make this symposium possible, and I'm looking forward to really two fantastic, exciting, blooming days in which the memory of this wonderful crop of wisdom and freedom and peace and democracy is going to be commemorated here from the bottom of my heart with the personal connection that links me to this history and this memory. Thank you to all for coming, and I'm really looking forward to this great, fantastic event. Thank you. And now, as you know, time is pressing, so I'm asking the first panelists to join us in order to start the Beyond Trace of the symposium.
morning. <clears throat> Good morning and welcome to our first panel uh, in our symposium. Uh, our first panel is Exile Studies at UMD from Zenobia Gabruvi and Juan Manuel Jimenez to the present. And I'm very happy to be part of this panel because it shows how the legacy started with Juan Manuel Jimenez, Zenobia Gabruvi, La Ciudad Palau de Nemes, but he, it has continued in our department with our alumni that will be sharing their knowledge and their investigation on exile studies. So, thank you for being here. And we'll start with Dr. Anne uh, Gillard Wild, lecturer at Catholic University. Uh, she completed her master's degree at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and her PhD at the University of Maryland, Cold Park. Her interests reside in the realist and naturalist novel of the 19th century, in particular, Las Dos, Pardo Bazán and Blasco Ibarri. The Spanish post for a novel, post for a novel, the contemporary Spanish narrative and the relationship between stock market tendencies and literary production. Today she will be presenting Remembering the Spain from the Pre-Exile, Juan Ramón Jiménez, McKinley Cantor, and in, in 1956. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd also like to thank all of the, 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 the symposium organizers, especially um, our moderators who just have such a tremendous responsibility. Um, and so thank, you. thank you to everybody. In 1956, the same year that Juan de Ron Jiménez won the Nobel Prize, McKinley Cantor was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for his novel, Andersonville. Andersonville is the story of a prisoner of war camp for Union soldiers in Georgia. It is told non-linearly from the perspective of both North and South, but encompasses the life of the camp, from the raising of the trees to begin its construction, to the final liberation of the captive Union soldiers. Andersonville was written by Cantor in Franco of Spain. That Cantor would write about the North American Civil War in a country that was still recovering from its own Civil War immediately draws parallels between these conflicts 70 years apart in history. It would be around Cantor's time in Spain that Juan Ramón would write from exile in Puerto Rico in 1953 about his last meeting with Francisco Pinar de los Ríos, during which they discussed his Patero y yo and, in particular, the page about Platano's death. Juan Ramon relates that Ginero de los Rios' words were, in my translation, it's perfect. You should have always written with such simplicity. With these words and this appendix, Platero y yo is at the same time a product of the pre-exile and the exile. The desire to maintain the literary integrity of this episode in time is also that of capturing a poetic portrait of rural Andalusia before the Spanish Civil War. I reference this appendix not as an interpretation of the death of Platero, but rather of the import of Ginero de los Rios' words for Jimenez in the early 1950s, as I am considering here in both of these works the recounting of a sojourn on donkeyback through the rural landscape of southern Spain from the perspective of an exiled Spaniard in the Americas and an American in Franco of Spain. To refer back to Andersonville, Nathan Dreyfus, one of the many prisoner protagonists interwoven in the novel, mentally escapes the horrors and brutality of the camp by remembering the time he lived in Mali circa 1856. And I quote, I am more fortunate than many people here because I have patience, imagination, and recollections to stay me. My body may suffer, it has fallen away. It may fall into nothingness, and I shall go into nothingness with it. But my mental health is superb. My spirit was never better. It is strong, quiet. I muster my humor with a shrug when you be. I have known many quiet places, and now I may go to them, released to ride where I listed my cart or my noodle 
seeing warm gray mountains saluting the milky blue sky, seeing poppies, hearing a woman cry to her child, Maria, in the village below my feet. Nathan Dreyfus <coughs> possessed a reservoir of pictures. Perhaps he had more beauty stowed away but than most any other prisoner in the place. He could go to Malaga. Cantor wrote Andersonville from a rented house near Torre Bolinos in Andalusia. His time in Spain impacted him, as can be seen by his narratives, the works of St. Francis and Lobo, as must his friendship with Ernest Hemingway, whom he visited at Fica Vigia when the latter was writing The Old Man in the Sea. The episode that Nathan remembers is a trip he made alone at the age of 15 into the mountains on a donkey, during which he encounters various locals, from each of whom Nathan learns a life lesson that he remembers from the prison camp. Among them are a priest who leads him down into a cave to pray. Nathan, who is Jewish, says, my body remains standing, but my soul knelt. A charcoal burner and his wife, and an outlaw man called a lobo, who himself inhabits a cave. For the charcoal burner, who suffers from poor eyesight, Nathan shares his wine and chews some quail before continuing on his journey and being taken prisoner by men working for the bandit. He is blindfolded and led along a tight, precarious mountain pass to the hideaway, where it is discovered that the bandit is the brother of the charcoal burner's wife. Nathan is then celebrated and tries to mentally memorialize his time in the cave. And I quote, he did not really wish to sleep at all. He wanted to stay awake and glory in the enormous blue and silver myth which Moonlight made of this region. Valley and shadow cave, shallow caves lost their entity as an actual party of the world's surface. They became legend, along with the story tinkle of goat bells somewhere in hills below, the wolves which howled on upper pinnacles, the gem made by a lounging sentinel overlooking the crack in the boulders, which was the door to his mountain closet. Nathan would later read in a British magazine that a lobo was captured and died in his jail cell from consumption. But he, and I quote Nathan, was able to divorce his own recollection of the bandit from the hateful, coughing, damp, expectorating misery of the picture conjured up. He saw a lobo always in his mind's eye, presiding over rude lunches by hillside fires. He saw him enriched by the moonlight and listening to the wail of his brother wolves even as he slept. Nathan's father is a wealthy merchant whose family accompanied him on his constant worldwide travels. And it is Spain Nathan chooses to remember from Andersonville. These treasures, invested through the years, brought to Nathan a perpetual income and a panage which could not be withheld from him by any Lord Chamberlain of the future. It accrued in Andersonville when sorely needed. Soldier, does stench arise in waves? There's honeysuckle tangling on a broken tower above the pale sea. Go and find it. Nathan's trip through the mountains of southern Spain hinges on his using the family gardener's donkey Tomas, whom he wants to purchase but settles on borrowing. He wishes to buy the animal a fancy halter, but knows he must await for the end of the journey because of the dangers that could await the rich foreign son of a merchant in the mountains. His father is terrified that Nathan will have a run in with bandits, but he proves his manhood throughout the ordeal and travels home safely, purchasing the halter in Huy before his arrival back in Malaga. This woven harness has ornate medallions and colored tassels, and Tomas tossed his head. He braked 17 times as soon as the new adornment was put upon him. There is an evident personification of Tomas from his reaction to the new harness to a hat of heavy straw with slits for his ears to stick through, which Nathan buys him to fend off the heat. And this is the same type of personification that we see in Platero y Joe. Writing in English, Cantor refers to Nathan's packing as a donkey. However, interspersed in this episode, written in two different parts, as Nathan mentally escapes the horrors of Andersonville, is some Spanish dialogue in which Cantor seemingly interchanges mulo and burro. He first refers to a burrito cart as Nathan chews the point of his past to focus on. The fine, strong cart he had in 1989. Better was the time when they'd come back to Spain again, Nathan recollected. He was 15 at the time. He decides to buy the mash from the gardener, which his mother objects, saying, I thought you planned to borrow a mule if. 
to which Tom Nathan responds that Tomash is a splendid donkey. There are later references to Nathan traveling muleback as well as to his mulo. The adventure Nathan has while riding Tomash is to places that for him are untraveled territory. Yet it is a sojourn to a place where he will later have a recollection of home, family, and of becoming a man, as the Ben Lobo calls him hombre. He thinks, open quote, it will be a memory for me when I am old, so old that I cannot bestride a burro, but must sit sideways like a woman. What a memory, what a joy. It is more potent than the oldest brandy, the richest wife in Jerez. The Borro par excellence in Spanish literature is Platero of Juan Ramón's Platero y Yo, who, unlike Nathan's exploration of unknown territory, takes his owner on a journey through Mogen on a well-known itinerary. Pradmo has acknowledged the analogy with Jesus Christ, the journey, the appearance, the contact with the poor, characteristics which we see replicated in Nathan's trip through the mountains of the Malaga region. Like Jesus, Nathan too is Jewish. Although Nathan comes from a wealthy family, he dresses like a peasant in rough clothes. He wants to buy tomas from the gardener, to quote, to know that he was mine. I should feel like an emperor. Hills, valleys, vistas, las colinas, las montañas, all mine, all mine, spread before my gaze as if I were king of the entire landscape. To which his mother responds, Ah, young ambition, Nate, you should not wish to be a king. The coincidence here is noteworthy regarding the analogy of kingship, but so is the journey into the known versus the unknown and the importance of this particular species of animal as transport. The description of Platero is well known, pequeño peludo suave, affectionate like a child. Tomas is a splendid donkey, young enough not to tire, but splendidly disciplined nor does he bite or kick. Space, both physical and mental, has been amply analyzed in exile studies. From both of these works comes a desire to preserve or memorialize a pre-exile Spain from the perspective of the mid-1950s. The Spain we see in both Patel y Jo and Andersonville is a rural Spain of poverty. Cantor's Nathan Dreyfus can be seen in stark contrast to the other prisoners and to the Confederate guards, many of whom are uneducated. He is shot and killed from atop a guard tower by Flory Tebbs, the dim-witted son of one of the houses neighboring the prison, and whose mother runs a one-woman brothel out of her home. His motive is simply that of wanting to kill a Yankee. Nathan's death is brutal, shocking, and unjust. As a worldly intellectual, we can of course read symbolism into his hands, into his death at the hands of the South. Nathan eked out a survival in Andersonville by teaming up with an imprisoned sign maker and bartering haircuts and shaves for food and other objects. He enlisted because he saw the injustice of his idle privilege while his countrymen sacrificed themselves. Accepting the theory that Platero's owner is a Christ-like figure, as we have seen, there are parallels in Nathan's life. Nathan himself sees the likeness. Open quote, he passed a troop of gypsies, and one of their women had a wet, reddish horror instead of a nose. She was dying of this cancer and had stuffed a rag into it, and her black eyes, once perhaps as lively as Nathan's own, her eyes stared and said, this is a horror, I am it. I am the horror, do you see me? How can you avoid seeing the horror which I am? Her claw came out for the coin he gave, and Nathan, though in a momentary agony, thought momentary agony, of the Jew who most of the Jews had rejected, and why had not he chosen to walk on Lucia with his healing ways a good 1,800 years after he left Palestine. Nathan's purpose for traveling alone is to prove his manhood. He sets out from the house his family is renting, goes into the mountains, and returns home. The poetic voice of Platero Joe also makes a circular cyclical trip through Moged, which reflects the changing seasons and their inherent metaphor of birth, growth, and death. And in the words of the poet, Juan Ramon, my translation, the memory of a different Moged linked to the presence of the new one, and my new awareness of the land and the people prompted the book. I have theorized that literature moves in cyclical patterns similar to those of the stock market. 
and that the coincidence to repetition of themes or styles can be explained by what Robert Proctor Jr. coined social media. Proctor was an analyst of the stock market theory proposed by Ralph Nelson Elliott and published in 1938 in the United States during the Spanish Civil War, and who asserted that the market moves consistently in cyclical series of five waves, three forward and two backward, a pattern which he believed can be found in all human activity, and for which reason termed each completed set of five waves a social movement, since it is the activity of man which determines the activity of the stock market. I have proposed that we can examine this concept from a qualitative rather than a quantitative perspective. Since literature, like the stock market, reflects human activity, I have observed that the movement of literary characters or voices follows this pattern. I have identified intraliterary or exogenous ways which are legible between different works of literature and encompass various authors and time periods, as well as intraliterary or endogenous ways within a single given text. I have studied the phenomenon of these exogenous waves over a 150-year period of literary production, which connects the realist naturalist novels of the 19th century, the novel of the post-war, and the 21st novel of the economic crisis. And here I observed a prevalent social mood of indignation and resentment. The two texts I'm considering here, the appendix from 1953 and these two episodes from Andersonville, are of the same time period as the Spanish post-Civil War novel. It has drawn my attention that one Cantor is not a Spaniard, but chose to write in Franco of Spain about pre-exile Spain. And Patero y Joe was written in Spain within the first quarter of the 20th century, before the historical dates assigned to the conflict. And his including of the appendix written in 1953 from exile contemporizes Platero y Jo with Andersonville. The literary memory of the death and therefore life of Platero, remembered by Pierre de los Rios and memorialized by Juan de Ramon, renews it from a different decade, even though its composition started around 1906. Within Platero y Jo and the remembrative episodes I have referred to in Andersonville, there's a marked back and forth movement as the character of Nathan Dreyfus and the poetic voice of Platero y Joe traverse Malaga and Mulga respectively. The stops made by Nathan, with the charcoal burner and his wife, the priest in the cave, the bandit and lobo, and the band of gypsies, as well as the marketplace in Kowin, are not linear. They bring him on and off of his physical path, even though he has no other destination than the metaphysical one of independence as the, of a 15-year-old on the brink of manhood. But the success, such as the hunting of quail and setbacks, getting kidnapped by bandits, progressively bring him towards his goal. Platero and his owner make many stops on their journey through Moguer and, like Nathan, observe philosophically and nostalgically familiar people, landmarks, and sites. Because of the geographic proximity between Moguer and Malaga, there are parallels between her itineraries, which, in a sense, are a type of peregrination. Between the two works, the common figures of the charcoal burner, the caves, the love of the animal, along with the ravages of life such as poverty and sickness, as seen from donkey back, all serve as a backdrop for the passage of time, much briefer in the case of Nathan, for whom the change of seeds is not calendrical, but rather spiritual. These two sojourns complete a social movement in Andersonville, Platero y Jo. Within the larger narrative, they have a marked beginning and end, and whose back and forth movement impels the travelers forward towards their objectives, which, once reached, begins a new social movement. The remembrance of these pre-exile war landscapes carries with it the memory of the travelers marking and being marked by the landscape before it was stamped by the ravages of the Civil War and distanced by exile, travelers who remember this formative experience which impelled them to a new purpose. The recognition of Corte Jimenez and Cantor in 1856 is also an homage to the pre-exile and indicative of a common social movement. Next presenter is Dr. Uh, Marilu Borg Caballero, originally from Huelva. Uh, she has just defended her doctoral thesis at the University of Maryland, College Park. Her doctoral thesis is about intellectual women of Spanish uh, Republican exile and poetry. She received a BA in English.
Constitution and Studies at the University of Huelva. She has a master's degree in European Literature and Language Teaching and a second master's in Pedagogy and Secondary Education. Prior to her studies at the University of Maryland, she taught at Harvard University. And she has participated in numerous congresses and published articles on women writers, exile studies, and travel literature in the 19th and 20th centuries. Today, she will be presenting Forgotten Legacies, Verses from an Exile in the Feminine. Thank you. So before I start, I would like to thank Professor Nara Calderon for inviting me to participate in this Congress. It is an honor to share this conversation with my colleagues um, here in my home university, right after defending my dissertation, and precisely on this topic, which I have dedicated several years of research. I found the Panorama of Spanish and Portuguese, also grad school, and all the institutions and people who made this event um, possible, as well as my colleagues who are sitting with me at this table, a very, very pertinent panel, like the title of my paper, A Table in Feminine. So it has been 80 years now since the end of the civil war that marked the history of Spain and brought with it the site of 1939. This conference honors dialogues and seeks to recover memories of the past in a time when we still speak of uncovering new mass graves, finding missing family members, letters, and unpolished works of those exiled. It seems particularly relevant, relevant this week as our past infiltrate speeches, headlines, and social action as the remains of the dictator are finally removed from that uncivil monument, as our professor Nardo has said. Um, the exile separate from um, dominant strategies and narrative of the national state of Franco's regime left open wounds that remain unhealed to this day. It should be noted that there are, there are as many different said exiles as they were individuals who were exiled. Although the research on the Spanish Republican side has not stopped growing in the last four years, this bibliography remains incomplete, and when the necessary work left to do, it is in depth the study of the works of the side women's writers who have been relegated to an inferior peripheral, peripheral position in the exile studies. Women who also represent spaces of memory and experiences of forced displacement. Therefore, today I intend to record some of these women writers and their works in a side, giving them the visibility and recognition they deserve. Especially this paper delves into the geography of memory presented in the verse in the Americas, Mexico, US, and Puerto Rico. Through a brief selection of verses by Concha Mendez, Ernestina Nacha and Bufin, Concha Ferroya, and Aurora Bornoff, I suggest a new reading of side of those experiences with written under the effect of work, uprooting, and the condition of being a woman, verses which also appear and core in the nostalgia of the past. They deserve to be added to the text of history, culture, and literature alongside what for far too many years has been dominated by the writing experiences of men. From the 19th century, the activity of the feminine stood out more in intellectual and political spaces with Emilia Polo Bazán, Rosalía de Castro, Concepción, Jiménez de Flaque, followed by political activists Clara Campoamor, Margarita Nelken, Federica Monsenio, Victoria Ken. At the beginning of the 20th century, the Ciencias Semilitas was founded, which promoted university education for women, and the Association, Asociación Universitaria Femenina, and the Liceum Club aimed, that, uh, aimed at the development of social, cultural, and literary activities for women. The access to education allowed for the literary empowerment of women and consequently an increase in women leaders. One of the most important accomplishments of the Second Republic was the Constitution of 1931 that included women's rights. This gave rise to a new model of women, modern, young, and upper middle class women with professional aspiration, who even transgressed the traditional feminine appearance and destabilized masculine norms. It is in this context of change that countrymen and Athena Champurthin come of age. Both were members of the Legion Club and contemporaries of the Generación 27. Concha Tardoya and Aurora Bournoff are also experiencing the important formative years. Somehow they all participated in and were witnesses to the social advance in a civil society and the modernization of Spanish life and culture. 
Although all of them were advanced and erudite for the time, the social pressure in, in their creative environments and setting, the disapproval and oppression, and oppression with their peers and the family, normative stereotypes, social censorship, the lack of space and independence create a dependence on others for pollution and recognition for their work. This is not to mention the difficulty of the world, exile and dictatorship. Cochamente and Ernestina de Champurthin belong to the first generation of sites from 1939. Cocha de Ardoya and Aurora Bono to the subsequent generation of sites during the 40s. Both generations present differences and similarities in their life experience in exile. In addition, they are representative of the different transoceanic places that mark the geographical diversity of the Spanish Republican exodus. Conchamente and Ernestina de Champurthin receive an education at home with a special emphasis on language learning. Both grew up in Madrid, um, Mendel was a voracious reader and swimming champ champion due to her desire of freedom, her adventurous spirit, and her desire to be a poet. She emancipated herself from home and traveled to Argentina, although she returned to Madrid at the beginning of the Second Republic. And Ernestina de Champurthin was a translator from a very young age. <coughs> Going against her father's wishes, she enrolled in the university studies but had to be accompanied by her mother. Unfortunately, the atmosphere of main security forced her to quit before finishing her study. However, both participated in the cultural life of Madrid in the 20s and the 30s and moved in intellectually elite third cycles where they both met their future, future husband, Conchamento Marley, the writer Manuel, Manuel Antola Guirre, and Anatina Champoutin, Marley Jose, Juan Jose Valentino. Shortly after the beginning of the war, Conchamento moved to England and later to France to protect her daughter, while Antola Guirre stayed in Spain with propaganda project. Conchamento waited for Antola Guirre in Paris after he passed through a concentration camp, he arrived sick and suffering to meet them. With the help of the other intellectual, they were able to leave for the Americas, they spent four years in Cuba and later moved to Mexico in 1943. Ernestino de Champorthin moved to Madrid, to Valencia, Barcelona, and Toulouse at most intellectual field. Domenchina was committed to politics with a political position in the government of the Second Republic. Aided by the Intellectual Assistance Committee in Toulouse, they were invited by Alfonso Reyes to La Casa de España in Mexico. These women's lives changed inside. After the years of the civil war and forced displacement, they had to start over, adapt to new places, and find accommodation of jobs to survive. Both Mendes and Champoutin left, left their families in Spain and became their main economic support for their husband writer, who were psychologically and emo emotionally devastated by the civil war. Mendes sold books published most, mostly by her husband, door by door to get money, and of course, all while she took care of, her, of their daughter. Champoutin had to work as a translator for the Fondo de Cultura in Mexico to provide for her family. Cordero Rivero points out that women intellectuals decided in 1989 had even fewer uh, opportunities than the older uh, women from lower social class. Punishment means sacrifice and resignation to family obligation for these women. The creative work was interrupted, the intellectual life was paralyzed, and their writing pushed aside. Mendes ceased writing from 1939 to 1944 when she published two collections and then she uh, published again until 1979. That coincides with the return trip to Spain. Due to the work, Champoutin would not begin writing again until 1952. She published six works that delved into a spiritual crisis before returning to Spain, where she continued publishing in 1978. It is not a coincidence that they resumed writing with trips to Spain. In addition, some Champoutin thematic, thematic material changed significantly after the return and encounter with the up and coming generations. This interaction is stopped by the melancholy, man, melancholy and nostalgia of her paradise lost. The poetry of Conchamendes in Mexico emphasized nostalgia memory of the past marked by divorce and depression where she befriends her solitude. We see a nostalgic way the voice that search for a born and that still ties her to her, to her native land. The sea, that poetic element used for the movement and means of connecting and disconnecting with Spain, is a recommended thing for Mendes. So yo, eh, de tierra adentro y de la meseta alta, pero la voz de los mares, de norte a sur me reclama, y no sé con quién quedarme, yo que nací castellana, si con la parda castilla o con el mar que me llama. Oigo sus voces azules como líquidas campanas, y esta otra voz que es de tierra, que es como la voz del alma. 
The sea also represents a state of memories of youth and freedom that has now become full of pain and melancholy. Antes me asomaba al mar y el corazón en el, corazón en el pecho se me ponía a cantar. Ahora cuando veo la mar, escucho a mi corazón y se me pone a llorar. This sensual memory is both available for her for and transferred to another space and time. While walking through a park in Mexico, she notes, me senté a reposar y ancho, per, y ancho perfume sentí que mis sentidos se adentraban y me vino al alma extraña angustia. El ala de un recuerdo aleteaba. Ah, sí, ya sé. Perfume de una rosa, otro país, el mío. En el Tina Chapultín, the soon writing up on her return to Spain, but was again confronted with experience and feeling of being uprooted. The memory of the book of the Bouget and her life outside of Spain made her painfully aware of an anxiety that is eternal. The absence of the space of her past brought about a new consciousness of science and memories of her past and wartime Spain. La noche se desgarra a golpes de culata, extrañeza de pasos irreales, ciudad en vela, o tal vez es el campo, y un moscardón se obstina contra vidrios herméticos, pero el campo no existe, hay una fuerza oculta, empeñada en destruir lo armonioso y lo puro. She remembers the firing squad, un miedo desde fuera, que jugaba los cuerpos contra la cal sobrante de la pared sin fondo, and faces the tragic story of her voyage into exile in Mexico. Quisiera llegar pronto porque el mar nos aleja, Este navegar juntos y tiene entre los dos una enorme distancia, el mar, más mal que nunca. The distance and belonging of the juxtaposition of the different places, special estrangement, or the fusion of the uh, here with the distant here as part of the total for Chambur Sin. Todos nuestros allá lejos y los que ya no guardan la vuelta de la luz saben que están aquí en su allá distante. All of the excitement. All the inside of 1939, Arranco. Okay. Okay. Uh, although the inside of 1939 was a massive displacement, they continued throughout the forties. Operation, other freedom, education of life, freedom, persecution, and censorship also forced subsequent escapes. This result in a second generation of inside composed of the children of the world. Under a dictatorship, the model of the perfect married woman was imposed, a Catholic woman dedicated to children and domestic space, which hardly, hardly agreed with the women's poet, the liberal mind of the modern models they represented. Concha Tardoya is situated between the exile mass of 1939 and the second exile generation. <coughs> Our Albert North is closer to the second generation. This was a different inside from the previous generations. As they were younger, they had more fully experienced the advantage of the Second Republic and all its advantages. Their exile offered opportunities for academic endeavors, and they were not forced to sacrifice their priorities for family obligations. Even though they were granted opportunities, they would not have had in Spain the estrangement and nostalgia for a homeland, a present in their work through memories, melancholy, and a need to reconstruct an identity in a new place. Concha Tardoya was born in Chile to Spanish parents. Her family returned to Republican Spain when she was 17. Tardoya attended the University of Madrid, where she studied philosophy and letters, but ended in Valencia, and studied to be a librarian. She was more about the loss of her body, of her only brother in civil war, and reflected on it in her poetry. In 1947, she went into exile. The displacement gives her the opportunity to finish her PhD at the University of Illinois. She taught Spanish culture and literature in Tulane and Boston. She would spend 30 years abroad before returning to Spain in 1977. Exile would be the beauty of the profound poetics of reflection and criticism on the painful experiences suffered during the civil war and separation from Spain. Death, solitude, and Spain as a leaf space, distant and long for all of the touring themes in her poetry. Writing was an exercise in self-exclusion, and language became an adaptive motherland, standing in both for her original home and her inability to adapt to the space that welcomed her. Es mi única parte de la palabra, esta palabra viva que derramo. Las sílabas resuman toda el alma, el pozo de silencio es apuñado. Flor, sustento, luz, piedad, el agua, vivo, respiro, bebo, pronunciando, quedo en verso y empiezo a castigar. Buenos días, al aire tan callado. 
The poetry of Conchamente reflects the terror and pain of a country of friends, of a life stained with hate, but, but with a hope of reconciliation. Si el dolor naciera, la alegría, la ilusión de una España clamorosa, unánime, feliz y trabajada, por las manos de todos, cada hora. Si de las penas madre de tus hijos salieras consolada y luminosa. Many of her poems are similar to those of Mendes and Chamburthy in church by nostalgia for a lost country and those killed in the war. Cicatrices del tiempo en las paredes amarillas, verdosas, funerarias, con asomos de mucos delicados, de aguas negras, perdidas, desbalando, sepultas, al origen, secreto de las lágrimas. Melancolía es para los ojos y este, amor, y este sensible amor que los traspasa. All the poems writing, right, written why in exile reflects on her experiences in the United States, like living in Manhattan, a condemnation of the treatment and living condition of the black community living in Mississippi, not unlike Lord Capoeta's Poeta Nueva York, 1930. Aurora Alburno, the youngest of these women's authors, was born in 1926 when Mendel and Jean Poutine were published in their first poem. From Asturias, her family had strong literary and political ties. She was only 10 years old when the Civil War started. Be being a child of the world left its mark on all of her poetry. At 18, Arbornoz was exiled with her family in Puerto Rico in 1944. She studied at the University of Puerto Rico under the mentorship of Juan Ramón Jiménez. She married an exiled Republican from Andalusia for later Valeria de Gilbert. <coughs> Arbornoz made several states in Kansas and part of the <coughs> Um, she studied comparative literature and spent time in Salamanca doing her PhD. She traveled to Puerto Rico in 1966, but returned definitely to Spain in 1968. She taught at the University of Madrid and the University of New York in Spain. Her academic work deals mostly with exiled writers from Spain. Her poetry is defined by the dialectics of separation and interior garden spirit in two by the past and the present. Yerbas nueva, alrededor de mi sueño. Joven olor de resinas en el viento, aguas niñas por el río, un cielo mío pequeño, sonido azul de campanas, lejos. Her poetry has echoes of both Machado and Guadalajara with a flow of time that is impossible to detain and a preoccupation with living evident in this poetry time o la gran el tiempo. Guardar este segundo, encerrarlo en palabras o en notas, en colores, vencer al otro tiempo, el otro tiempo fuera, con arrugas de olvido. At times, a division reflects a splitting of the subject, mi yo, diferente, mi punta, igual y contraria. Lleva dentro un distinto yo, posible, mi mirada, quiere entrarte por los ojos y se congela delante. Mi más yo, abundante, lejano. And again, distance and memory appear to the sensorial and remind us of Mendes' <coughs> verses. Flor de olor amarillo, es verdad que en el prado de la niebla tanto ha llovido que hasta los naturales han florecido. Hoy con la primavera, en un marzo lejano de distancias y tiempo, me trajo el sol un ramo de violetas. Violetas infantiles, sin perfume, con frescura de hierba y calidad de lluvia. Vienen llenas de tardes, con sabor de boloña y nombres repartidos de los poetas. Arbornoz eh, uses writing as a tour to her childhood memories and testify her experiences marked by work and exile. This is not simple by the by, by it is not simply the byproduct of nostalgia in her poetry, but is driven by a modern spirit of discovery of the Spanish war in the Americas. She was fascinated by the Afro-Caribbean influences in Puerto Rico, and also included the characteristic of the Caribbean with mythology of regionalism in her poetry, a product of high gravity in many ways, reflecting an Spanish peregrina that arose from America open to avant-garde dimensions and connection with other languages and culture. So, to sum up, the sketch of these four women poets has been presented different exile experiences that show the duplicity of this phenomenon in their voice in feminine. They all refuge in their memories to survive forced displacement and recover lost space. There is a clear division between the first two women's poets who prioritize the family and the role of support. These are exiled according to a patriarchal framework of commitment and dependence of the husband and hallucination to circumstances. The second group is determined by the later displacement and they use the poetic word for maintaining memories alive. But they do not sacrifice the production of their works. On the contrary, they evolve in the academic and intellectual. All art experiences are linked to autobiography, with take refuge in poetic face and heal wounds. 
The traumatic experiences of the civil war, and forced displacement, dislocation between a land of origin and the lost and the host land, land, all show the uniqueness of each displacement and part of the Spanish Republican geographical diaspora. <coughs> Her words in feminine are also experiences that have a history to communicate and necessary voices to listen. They deserve their own spaces and recognition because they were part of yesterday and today. Thank you. Thank you, Marius. Our next presenter is Dr. Kathleen Taylor from Thompson University. She received her PhD from the University of Maryland in 2017. Her dissertation, Compañeros del Exilio, Una Cartografía de Resistencia Cultural, focus on the cultural resistance of free intellectual couples following the Spanish Civil War. Maria Teresa Leon and Rafael Alberti, Carmen Martin Gaite and Rafael Sanchez Perlosio, and Maria Luisa Elio and Comi Garcia Scott. In addition to incorporating female voices into a larger cultural discourse, her project also analyzes stra strategies of cultural resistance used both in exile and in the interior of Spain. She has been a lecturer at Towson University since 2012. And today she will be presenting her paper entitled Memory and Resistance in the Exile Writings of Maria Teresa Leon. Before I begin, I'd like to echo the sentiments of Anne and Marie Luz about um, what an honor it is to be here today and to thank everyone that um, put so much effort into organizing this very important event. So thank you. Um, due to their political ideals and active participation in the Spanish Civil War, Rafael Alberti and Maria Teresa Leon have held what might be considered an iconic status in the study of Spanish Republican exile. While both of their names have been linked to this culturally and politically active period, as has happened with many intellectual couples, or we might say too many intellectual couples, Leon's literary persona has long been overshadowed by the very public voice of Alberti. For far too long, studies of Maria Teresa Leon were focused solely on her autobiography, Memoria de la Melancolía, the Marriage of Melancholy. Can you put the microphone Is that better? Um, for far too long, studies of Maria Teresa Leon were focused solely on her autobiography, Memoria de la Melancolía, in which she gives testimony to the personal and collective experiences of being a woman during the first decades of 20th century in Spain, the years of the Spanish Republic, the Spanish Civil War, and the pain and nostalgia of exile. However, the most cited sentence of Memoria de la Melancolía has been, and now I am the tale of the comet, o ahora yo soy la cola de cometa, to describe how Leo lived in Rafael Alberti's shadow, or was often known more as the wife of Alberti than for her own literary efforts. My presentation today is part of a larger project in which I argue that this vision of Leon as the tale of the comet is problematic because it is one that she herself helped to create in order to navigate her presence in the intellectual and cultural circles of the early 20th century due to the patriarchal norms of the moment. And I also think that this was affected by the, um, her uh, participation in the Communist Party and gender norms established by that. Until recently, the past, I would say the past decade or so, the focus on Memoria de la Melancolía has overshadowed the extensive literary activity of Maria Teresa Leon, which includes no less than seven novels, eight collections of short stories, four essay collections, and several plays. This doesn't include her journalistic contributions or still unedited texts, some of which um, have recently been published in the past five years or so. By studying some of Maria Teresa Leon's lesser known texts, we discover that our author was as culturally and politically engaged as Rafael Alberti, if not more so. In her text written in exile, Maria, Maria Teresa Leon seeks to present a vision of history that is contrary to the official Franquist discourse. In many cases, the historical and mythical characters that she includes in her texts, for example, El Cid or Goya, establishing parallels between the uh, Spanish Republican exiles and figures of exile during the 19th century were mentioned by Dr. Penrose this morning. 
They are symbols of the lost cultural battle of the Civil War and a preoccupation with the future of Spain in their absence. While these themes are present in numerous texts written by Maria Teresa Leon, today I will focus on the short story collection Fabulas del Tiempo Amargo and the play La Libertad en el Tejado. In both of these texts, we see Leon's pained vision of Spain in her absence and how she uses both of these texts as an attempt to maintain Republican cultural memory. Fabulas del Tiempo Amargo was first published in 1962, but they were likely, the stories in this volume were likely written towards the end of the 1940s, when Leon had already spent over a decade, decade exiled in Argentina. As part of the um, exile experience, we can see in her text that she's, there's a constant preoccupation for Spain in her absence, and it's a Spain that is often seen as unrecognizable. This preoccupation for the interior of Spain can be seen in Fabulas del Tiempo Amargo, which, according to Gregoria Torres Nebrera, are stories of a historic moment that is pained, tragic, and a mixture of blood, exile, and solitude. The first stories in this collection evoke scenes of um, a barbarism that are scenes that are nearly primitive of pros uh, persecution and human At the same time, we can see mixed in these stories the personal and collective experiences of exile. We know how Maria Teresa Leon describes the, her own experiences of persecution, expulsion, leaving Spain behind, the sentiments of impotence that are provoked when she leaves her um, country behind, and the always imagined return to Spain. In the story, El Viaje, for example, Leon seems to make reference to her to leaving Spain. The anticipation of this trip provokes a stream of, of memories of her youth, of the war, and of her participation in the guerrillas del teatro. She knows that leaving behind Spain is also the end of a very important time in her life. She says, no dudo que los días mejores han concluido. Han concluido. Entraron uno a uno en el reloj del fondo de los tiempos. And as she says goodbye to Spain from the plane, she says, las nubes saludaban a la águila y yo seguía tendida sobre mi tierra. Abrazado más que una amante estuvo nunca. Soy santo de desolación. El tiempo transcurría con sus pies descarnados. Nada era cierto y del todo incierto. La curva del amor aún posaba su doble palma en la palma de mi mamá. Y así masculina y femenina juraba fidelidad sobre el libro del aire. Maria Teresa Leon also signals that leaving Spain in reality isn't a decision, but the consequence of maintaining fidelity to the ideas, to her political ideals, and never giving up. She realizes that her compromise, and also Alberti's political compromise, imply that she must continue this fight from far away. And as she leaves Spain, she says, Era el impavido de lo que sin mí iba a permanecer. Los duelos, las fatigas, el árido color de la noche. Los bordes de los lechos desarreglados de improviso. La muerte involuntaria, las auroras llegando por costumbre a abrir las flores. La voz que iba a quebrarse al ser interrogada. El riso el señor de mayo. La londra de agosto, la perdiz de septiembre. Todo cuanto sucedería mi ausencia golpeaba mi corazón. In the end, all of these images give her the sense that she is abandoning her people. She says, Dolor de no acompañarte, congoja de haberte abandonado. Abandoning her people and abandoning Spain aren't the only themes that weigh on her conscience, conscience as she leaves Spain. She's also worried about the her, the memory of her fight with Spain. She says, He dejado allá abajo hermanos y hermanas hermosas como el que más. Puede que me estén buscando y quien les dirá donde estoy. 
She seems to explore the response to this question in another, in the final story of how we must the people here and there, like for aquí, for allá. In the last story of this, question, of this collection, the author anticipates the probability that the return to Spain will likely be a dissolution. Accompanied by a white, a white horse, Juan el Fuerte, Juan el Bravo, and Juan el que sin mirar las intenciones de la tierra, which is a clear reference to Juan Panadero, the poetic person, um, poetic character created by Rafael Alberti. <clears throat> when she returns to Spain in this imaginary uh, return, the narrator doesn't find the country that she had left in 1939, but instead a space of repression, vigilance, and the worst possible outcome of um, that she has been forgotten, especially the um, the fight that she, Alberti, and other intellectuals had fought for so long. But the one thing that she does see when she returns to, to in this imaginary return is that she says, and there in the shadows is my closed fist, which is a reference to um, <clears throat> her fight. Because of the her preoccupation for Spain and her absence, a large part of her fight and of her force of a large part of her fight from exile is the work of countering the official Franco's memory. And she continues within this official memory, her name as well as the name of Rafael Alberti and of so many other exiles have been erased completely from the, from the collective consciousness of Spain. However, the author still maintains hope that there are resistant spaces within Spain, which she elaborates in the play La Libertad del Mercado, or Freedom on the Rooftops. In this dramatic work, which was published for the first time in 1989, Maria Teresa Leon, explores what she calls the present time. And she says, um, in nuestros frágiles tejados, época actual. Much of the first act is dedicated to establishing the contrast between the scenic space and the extra, um, or the um, space that we don't see, the street. This represents the, um, what has been forgotten within Spain as a result of the official memory imposed by the um, Frank Rush regime. While the rooftops represent the resistance and the um, lost Republican cause. Additionally, she contrasts the unfortunate situation of those that live in the street, sleeping and blind to the reality of the resistance in which they live. Yo también sueño, y en ti, oh impura ciudad convertida en tu sombra, capital de la gloria, de nuestra gloria tan valiente apuñalada. A large part of the resistance and hope that Maria Teresa Leon has for the future is, on, is within the younger generation, and it is very easy to establish some parallels between the young woman in the play, known only as La Chica, and the life of our, of Maria Teresa Leon. In the second act, a young couple visits the rooftops. They are from a younger generation, which in, in general has forgotten the Second Republic. But at the same time, for Maria Teresa Leon, they also represent the hope of a better future. The romantic relationship between this couple reminds us of the relationship between Romeo and Juliet, because these characters, known only as La Chica y El Muchacho, are from families of um, uh, um, conflicting political ideas. And we can also think here of the um, relationship between Rafael uh, Alberti and Maria Teresa Leon, 
because we know that Verdi and Teresa Leon had a strong impact in converting um, Raphael Alberti to uh, more liberal ideas, and there were many conflicts uh, with his family because of that. El muchacho um, says to the girl, Tus padres siempre me fueron de la oposición. A mí me reprochan todos los días en mi casa que te veo. Me dicen que eres una muchacha de aquellos años terribles y que ningún amigo mío se acercaría a ti. Creen que estoy trastornado. However, la chica, just as Maria Teresa Leon always did, maintains her political ideas and she tells him, Vete, idiota. No quiero perjudicar. Yo llevaré siempre un clavel rojo entre los dientes. And this reference, reference to the clavel rojo is a clear reference to um, uh, Rafael Alberti's uh, poetic works. Um, in La Libertad del Tejado, Leon continues to present a vision of a broken world characterized by violence. But in the end, she seems to maintain hope. In the last scene of the play, El Muchacho returns to the rooftops, and he tells La Chica that he came to see her even though his family was against it. And he declares, Si, sí, me llevo a rastras a la otra parte de mi generación, a la que lleva un clavel rojo entre sus dientes. With her symbolic exit from the rooftops, La Chica dice, Si, sí, Me voy para que la humanidad vuelva a empezar. And with this symbolic exit from the rooftops, we can observe the hope that Leon had that a younger generation um, would continue her fight in her absence. It has been proposed that for women, personal history is related to not only gener um, gender, but also national history and world history. When we study the ways that Maria Teresa Leon represents her own experiences and those of other women um, throughout uh, Spanish history and world history, we note no a consciousness on the part of the author about the links between the personal experiences and collective experiences. An analysis if, of many texts written by Leon show us that there are many versions of our author, which she explores through her texts. <clears throat> um, in large part, it was her that created this image of herself, of the tale of the comet, in order to participate in the intellectual um, environment of the first decade of the 20th century. Um, the, themes, the topics of the Civil War and the desire to present a version of history that was contrary to the official Francoist version, along with a preoccupation for Spain in her absence, appear with very frequently in the texts of both Maria Teresa Leon and Rafael Alberti. Through these texts, we can perceive the profound nostalgia that the author had through various decades of exile. Um, however, in La Libertad en el Tejado, we can see that she never lost faith in the possibilities for resistance in the interior of Spain. And all of these works, in um, combination with other works, such as Contra Viento y María, Y Juego Limpio, show us that Maria Teresa León was uh, as dedicated to her political and cultural ideals as Rafael Alberti, and that she needs to be recognized for her own um, literary production and dedication to Spain. And as uh, her unedited texts are uh, recuperated, we will continue to see the importance of her work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, we have now some time for questions. I have a question. Not having those again. Um, so I'm wondering, um, several of you have talked about the experience of exiled women. And, you know, we, we scholars of gender and sexuality, um, have, have studied often 
the construct, the social construct <coughs> of, of gender and sexuality. And of course, you know, Judy Butler is one of the, the most common writers and critics about that. And I'm wondering, in your studies, um, if you find that the experience of these exiled Spaniards, female Spaniards, had a role to play in some type of reconstruction of what it meant to be female, what it meant to be feminine, in, in, a, in a, especially a post-Civil War era, or, or even during the Civil War. I, I don't know if this is something that um, you've thought about or you found in your studies, but I'm, I'm just kind of throwing it out there to see what what experiences have you had with, with this, this concept? Well, I, one thing that Judith Butler talks about is that she, she links gender to performance and that women or men also encounter problems when they don't act out what is considered the norm of their gender. <coughs> um, so one of the things that I analyze in my, my project is that Maria Teresa Leon, in many of her works, describes herself as la cola de, de la comenta de Tierra de Comet, where she talks about, she kind of diminishes her role in um, very important events, such as um, removing the works of art from the Prado and taking them out of Spain to save them. And when she talks about that experience, for example, she talks about, um, well, they chose me because the men were busy doing uh, other things. Um, and I think that, well, La Cola de Cometa is a very useful idea for describing many of the women exiles and many women writers from the 20th century because they were often placed in a secondary spot um, I think, especially Maria Teresa Leon, um, is trying to perform that cola de cometa um, so that she can participate in the um, intellectual circles of the early 20th century. And I also think it was complicated by the um, gender norms of the Communist Party, which they aren't always super clear about that, very intentionally, um, but the role of the women was supposed to be kind of a motherly role, role in uh, taking on maybe more traditional roles. Yeah, um, I agree with that. Like also like, if we think about what happened in the second republic, the like, long for the mother that was born, so they, like, they were like under that um, label that they could like do more things in Spain, but after they take like after they see the world, they need to they need to, to leave, um, go to Mexico. In my like in my case, the first two who were like in Messina and many the first generation um, of the massive exile. Um, also, we need to think that Mexico at the time was like the society was very patriarchal. At the same time, I didn't have like access to go to the intellectual cycles as they did. So. They have no choice. They said like, okay, that's time for resignation now. I just I keep my family. I try to you know um, do the economic the economical part, and they they wrote, but they wrote in privacy that they published them like after, and we can see that writing was the ref, like the refuge, like that it was like an inner exile in a way, in a in a in a way. So yeah, as also like the novel of Rios is the same like example. She was uh, trying to achieve, she became at the beginning in her youth and writing and translating. Uh, but then once she found one of the messages, she said, "Well, I encontrado el genio, so I'm trying to help him." So yeah, in a way they were like you know, una crucificada. They were trapped. They can, they they could. But, it, but they couldn't. Can one say something? Of course. Uh, I wanted to tell you that 
I, 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 I met Maria Teresa Leon in Buenos Aires. And she, she lived there for many years. And I saw her socially. Um, and she was a very, a very, uh, a very, a very open person. And she was a very, a person who was as strong in a, in a room as Rafael was. He was a very important presence, but she was also a very important presence. <coughs> I'm sorry, I should have. Did, did, you, did you hear what I said? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, so they, the the kind the the, the cometa the image doesn't fit the real person in a uh, uh, in, in in a social in a social context and in a political context because when there were political discussions, she was out there as front as Rafael was. And by the way. Your friend who wrote the, uh, the, uh, the Constitution lived in the same building uh, of Raphael, and in the middle was the son of uh, uh, um, Mussolini. So it was quite a house in the <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And, and one more thing, I think my, uh, the example I'm going to give tomorrow really speaks about enormous changes in women uh, because of the professional men could not be professional in, in exile, especially those who went to France. So therefore, the women had to go to work and do things that the men couldn't do. So the, the social problems <coughs> as they were defined, were really very different, at least for some people. That's okay. I think that that's a really important point, that there are um, kind of these different versions of Maria Teresa Leon, one that she kind of presents as of herself, um, but then when we read other people's descriptions of her, um, and in particular the um, first comprehensive biography that came out about her several years ago, describes her as this very rebellious, strong, strong-willed, and you know, protagonist in many of these things. Yeah, and I also these women were like one who need to save like the situation, like those who were weak because of the war, was then like the men, like who were the people who lost the war, and they need to say to, to do something about. So just yeah, they start like going out, um, selling books, translating from the from the Cultura Economica, because they had no choice. But even do their roles as an inner side. I would like to thank you all because this panel was very interesting and I'm very happy that uh, the panel dedicated to the women uh, wrote in exile is the first panel of this conference. It's a very good sign and it's, uh, it follows as well a conference in Madrid last week or two weeks ago about uh, the women in, in exile. So it's, uh, it's a good sign of the, of the recognition of the work and uh, uh, you contribute to that, and now maybe we see exile in a different way than 30 or, or 40 years ago, thanks to uh, the works that you have been made among other researchers about these women. So uh, I wonder if uh, the place they, they give to themselves, because uh, uh, even if it's maybe it's, it's a joke from Maria Teresa Leon to say, so la cola del cometa, maybe the role they, they consider they have has something to do with uh, the former situation to, uh, during the Civil War because they had the impression uh, that feminist rights were a little bit sacrificed to a cause that was more important than their own cause, that was the cause of the Republic and then of the exile. So do you think there is 
the same strategy that goes on during all these years, or do you think uh, the strategy and the priorities have changed? That was my first uh, question. My second question is about memorialism. Now we tend to uh, give value to the memories, to, to the memorias, such as Memoria de la Melancolia the, from Maria de Salion, and maybe other, other writings of Maria Zambrano, uh, the Livio Destino, for instance, or of Concha Mende, of, of, of Concha Mende, or Carmen Conde, but for instance, Por el Camino Viendo Sus Orillas. So these are texts that contribute to our vision of what was the civil war, the exile, uh, the opposition to Francoism. So, um, to, to what extent are now uh, these texts that are an explanation of, of the exile, so to speak, uh, to what extent do they rule our perception of exile literature? Because maybe we explain for instance, poetry, thanks to the memories, thanks to these texts, uh, such as La uh, Rueda Perdida, for instance, of Alberti. We have an interpretation of Maria Teresa uh, theatre, thanks to Memoria de la Melancolia. Uh, and to what extent is it uh, good, to, is it right? To, inter uh, to give these interpretations according to the vision of the role in history. That was my second question. I think, I think that it's important to study not only the, the memories, but also the poetic texts, the dramatic texts, um, and I would say that Perhaps we need to think about Hudsdorf's idea that there are two versions of autobiography, the actual autobiography and then the other texts that are written. So for example, when you mentioned El Arbol de la Perdida, Rafael Alberti uses that as a text to really explain his importance to the world um, and everything that he's achieved and all of the important people that he has met, but he really never talks about the nostalgia, the pain of exile. We do see that in his poetic works. Um, so I, I think that when we, we think about the memories, we need to think not only about the autobiographies, but all of the, what we might call complementary texts or supplemental texts that give us a, a much broader vision of, of this also, like concerning the uh, Polish, Polish her, her memories, but if we compare her poetry and the memories, they are completely different. Like in the poetry, you can see the pain, you can see you can see the suffering, you can see as a refuge, you can see as a way of like conducting like her dream in a way to like or grasp like her dream to survive. But if you read the memories. They are reconstruction of the happiness of her lives, of how important she was with Atolaguirre. Atolaguirre is always present um, in her memories. Um, so, in a way, like in the case of Conchamen, la, las memorias, the memories, they are, she said, como una manera para levantar el, el, el vuelo. Like, I, she wrote, like, she wrote the memory, but her, um, was the one who compiled the memories. It was a way like to have the space that I belong through my memories as my poetry couldn't. Or probably because of that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be like read by my poetry after my memories published. <coughs> so, yeah, like there are like two versions of hair in the memories and the poetry, but um, if we interpret poetry like aside from their memories, we can see those things, topics. And of course they have like a fundamental role in, in exile, as your first question, because they were, were like behind, but always present. So, of course they, they had.
one one last comment before we break. Unfortunately, rest of time, then we, we can come back to, to this wonderful panel. Indeed, I I join uh, with uh, uh, Professor Kanadeli congratulating you all. Um, a, a comment and a question on on Anne's uh, linking Michael Cantor and Anderson Hill to Paramo Jimenez and and the Spanish Civil War, um, which is usually with her. It's, it's an idea that it's certainly not in the forefront. And I thank you for bringing the analogies. And my question would be, in what sense, and of course the, the, the memory of the, of the Americans of the Civil War in this country um, has refurbished through memory battles, particularly after the presidential election of someone that I would not name. Um, and, uh, and of course, we are going through um, a process of memories, memory battles in, in Spain. It's, it's, in fact, we, we're just opening. <laughs> we're just opening. The, the kind of worms have been uh, basically open before. With the, at the very beginning of, of the day, we are, we are hoping to, in fact, memorize uh, this, this place that will be somehow disinfected uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, to what extent you, would you link Amsterdam to a narrative or a group of narratives in, in, in around the Spanish Civil War? Um, would you choose one particular text that you think that, that could? Mm -hmm. That then you, you could link to to Andersonville. Uh, do you think that uh, Killing Cantor, in, in a sense, was uh, reading, um, uh, openly uh, touched by the Spanish conflict, the myth of the Spanish conflict, which was so strong, uh, still very much alive in, in 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 the U.S. at the time? Sure, I I do, and. Um and there are, there are two uh, biographies of McKinley Cantor. One is by his grandson and one is, is by his son. And then they both discuss this and, and his grandson, who lived very close by, uh, went to Library of Congress where they had 154 boxes of his papers. And he went through each and every one of those boxes to try to unearth. Um, you know, you're living in Spain in the Franco's era, of course, the Civil War is going to be extraordinarily present. Um, and, and he wrote a book called El Lobo, he wrote um, uh, the works of St. Francis, which were based upon his time in Spain. Um, but I think that, that there are several narratives that we could link to that. Um, the one that called to me most was Contemporary Joe at the moment because of those, the parallel journey on donkey back, the, the sacrifice. Um, but, but I do believe that, um, that history is intertwined and that, um, and, that, and that there is a strong connection there. But would you, would you, would you, think, would you think that there is a particular narrative on the Spanish Civil War that you would also link to, to the Panthers novel? Sure, I, I would think that, that, that he is, is, would be on the side of Republicans like that is absolutely he was as a journalist he was president at the Liberation of Buchenwald and when and the, the camp commander uh, Henry Vers at Andersonville was he was a Swiss born German speaker and as you read Andersonville you often have the impression that you are reading a, a Nazi death camp um, so yeah, I think that was very strong before but and also as a Jewish writer I, I believe that that um, there have been, you know, in, in the books that his son and his grandson wrote, there have been references to doctoral theses where people have tried to, um, you know, make political statements that the family disagree with. Um, but I, I do believe he, he would have been pro-Republican. Is, is that the question that you were that you were asking? Is that 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 um, yes, that he was absolutely. Um, believed in the rising of the, of the oppressed people. Um, would, you, would you be, could we link him to another transnational Jewish origin writer as Mark Selman? As, yeah, as Mark Selman? Absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. That, that's, um, that's not something that I hate consider Shelma. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. 
With this, we finish the first part of our first panel. Briefly, we'll continue with the second part of our first panel. But uh, right now, I just want to thank our presenters. So let's give them a round of applause, please.